for that, um, like we did last year, we invite an incredibly smart uh, uh, um, and provocative team uh, designer, in this case, Naomi Clark, who's a uh, local um, uh, uh, game designer. I always think of Naomi as a, a sort of an online culture guru. She has a background uh, making all kinds of games for, uh, for the internet, browsers, social media networks, um, mobile devices. Um, both highly commercial and highly experimental. She worked at Lego for many years, really building their whole game division, and now works independently. So, um, uh, at least their online game division, I should say. So, um, so uh, Naomi has been asked to respond to the conference, to, to think about what's been going on for the last two days, and uh, provide some kind of informal uh, uh, thought-provoking response that, that maybe will lead to a discussion. After that, we really want to spend a little bit of time, the final moments of the conference, asking you guys what, you know, what worked, what didn't work, and what we can do next year to make practice better. Um, but before we get to that, uh, let's give it up for Naomi Clark. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Let me switch over to my slideshow. You want dim, or you'll be fine? A uh, little, little dim might be good. So what's going on? Something weird's happening. Oh, it's not weird. Oh, I think I know what happened. I have to turn this off. Okay. Great. So, um, thanks for sticking around to the end of the conference. Uh, like Eric said, I'm your contestant for this year in the, uh, the one-sided game of absorb everything in the conference and regurgitate it, so please don't adjudicate me too harshly. Um, I, have, uh, I did not know at all what I was going to talk about when I showed up yesterday morning, and I made this, uh, this presentation during the conference. Uh, so it's uh, stuff that all of you have taught me, um, your, your tweets, your talks, uh, so thank you. And it's also combined with whatever was sort of crusted on the inside of my brain um, before I got here. Uh, so first, I thought, um, let's play a game before, together before we leave. Uh, nobody's done this yet uh, as a staple of game design conferences. So, so here's a game that I designed also during the conference <laughs> for all of you. Um, and here's how we were going to start playing. Please close your eyes. You have to all close your eyes. Eric, don't peek. Don't peek. <laughs> Uh, now, you're going to just listen closely to what I'm saying and see if you can listen closely enough to what I'm saying to hear how this game works. 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one. Open your eyes. That game is called Listen Carefully for the <laughs> 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 Okay, so that was a little bit of 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 a and um, so I, I made that game for you. I never said it was going to be a good game, um, but the dev years is, I think, is pretty good. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or if you didn't like it, I guess this is what it looks like in, in dance notation. But either way, this is all still not so bad. Um, but you know, and maybe it's not a game, right? We were just talking about that. Uh, and uh, maybe you even feel like, well, why did I do that? Uh, was I manipulating you? I sort of want to talk a little bit about manipulation and game design and how we try to control emergent systems. Um, even simple systems like conversations. So I'm wondering if you, tell me if you've ever had a conversation that went something like this. Uh, somebody might ask you what the best film of 2012 is. 
maybe you say Wreck It Ralph, maybe you say something else, and then you get an answer like this. <laughs> uh, so there's something going on in this conversation that not everyone who was participating was aware of. It was actually a quiz in the guise of a conversation. And um, I like to talk about games with friends who don't identify as gamers, uh, and even people who say things like, I don't really play games at all, and sort of look at me with trepidation when I tell them I'm a game designer. And one quote that I found particularly memorable uh, was this one. Uh, the idea here is that you know, someone else might be manipulating the system more artfully than you if you're a novice player and will lead to your social disgrace. Uh, and as gamers, I think we accept this possibility all the time and maybe sort of jump into new experiences with relish, but it's definitely not as easy for everybody out there. And uh, maybe you know, the ambiguity of less goal-oriented games can be even more frustrating if you are anxious about the loss of orientation or, or agency when you don't know what's going on. This quote's actually not about Passage. I'm just picking on Jason. Um, it's about a different art game, which will remain nameless. Um, but the surprise revelation of like, oh, you're going to find out what's going on is somehow really attractive to game designers. Uh, and you can see it in the simplest form. Um, when beginning level designers, I was, uh, just had a class I was teaching work with a load runner. Uh, level designer on, from the NES version. Uh, that, you know, and when you're starting out doing level design, uh, you might put a lot of hidden traps and surprises in to screw with the player. A little T-shaped brick over there is like an invisible trap that's going to make this level impossible to win. Um, and I'm sure you can think of any number of more sophisticated bait and switch tactics that have happened in games. And uh, sometimes my family and loved ones have accused me of having a sort of game designer mindset in conversation. So I was reminded of this at the reception on Friday when Frank was regaling a couple of us with a tale of a conversation he had recently with his neighbors about uh, the topic of price gouging. And that's a topic that got hot around here recently as people lined up to get bread and water before the hurricane hit. And so Frank is in favor of price gouging. Um, <laughs> and you're apparently among good company. And if you're curious about this, I'm sure he'd be happy to tell you about why. Uh, but, um, and so if, you know, Frank, were you were in a conversation with him and he said something like this, that, you know, the, the expected counter move is, is to say something like, like this, to sort of continue the conversation, <laughs> sort of bounce the tennis ball back. Um, but apparently that's not what happened in this conversation that Frank had. Uh, it sounds like it's something more like this, um, that they didn't even really respond. And later on, Frank found out that, uh, that at least one of his neighbors was upset with him um, about uh, supporting price gouging. And I don't know, I'm sort of, I was sort of imagining in my mind, maybe it was even something like this, like you know, a feeling of disorientation. <laughs> what's, going, what's happening in this conversation? And, but, the, but I'm projecting because this is sort of what I'm accused of doing sometimes um, by, by my loved ones uh, you know, know, who don't know how they're supposed to react you know, when I make controversial statements like, I don't even believe in free will, or, <laughs> <laughs> or I think death is just as meaningful as life. <laughs> like, what, what am I even talking about? Um, and so as game designers or conversationists, we're always contending with other people's expectations. Um, as R Richard Garfield pointed out at the beginning of the conference, uh, you can even view game balance this way. It's sort of defined by whether players expect that a certain strategy or activity is going to be viable in a game. And as Annika Wern said, people's expectations of what's going to happen in a game because it's a game have a huge constraint on how players are even able to experience them. Uh, but underlying the psychology of expectations, I think, is something else that games deal with constantly that, that comes up in these conversations with non-gamers, uh, this feeling of uncertainty. And uncertainty is something that games deal with all the time, and that it's almost a, one of the things that we trade in. Uh, and it's part of many academic definitions of games, the idea that different circumstances and outcomes can emerge from systems. I've been thinking about uncertainty a lot this weekend. It's come up a lot in conversations and talks. Uh, and I, I was even thinking about it just now, uh, how in disparate games uh, like Proteus, where uh, the, there's a mystery about what's going on in this little beautiful world that you're wandering through, and it creates such a sense of wonder and awe. Uh, all the way to high-level esports like League of Legends, where millions of fans are sort of on the edge of their seats wondering who's going to win the world finals. Um, uncertainty, however, is really difficult for human beings, uh, as Jesse was mentioning yesterday when he was talking about ambiguity, aversion, and control bias. 
It's very hard right now for Romney supporters, hopefully you can see, um, who didn't have the reassuring probabilities of Nate Silver on their side, and now they're kind of wondering whether their churches are going to be replaced by mosques that, that gay marry people. give them abortions. <laughs> So, uh, uncertainty, of course, is a, is a really central part of human experience. A lot of people have written about it. These books come in different flavors depending on your taste, whether you're a Buddhist or a sort of a management al analyst. Um, but, you know, when I think about uncertainty and games, uh, I realize there is one group of people who's constantly dealing with uncertain situations where they're not familiar with what's happening. They don't have control over a situation. They feel like they don't know the rules or, or what's going on or what they're supposed to be doing. And, I'm think, and I mean kids. Kids are confronting these kinds of things constantly. That doesn't mean that they're good at it. They're, uh, they're all sort of failing in one way or another, doing mortifying things like falling down and crying or embarrassing themselves. Um, you know, listening to music that's frankly juvenile. Um, <laughs> but that's all okay, and we accept that as okay because they're kids. This is part of why I love designing games for kids. Uh, they're very accepting of weird shit that you throw at them in games. Um, and they're, you know, they're even very tolerant of what most of us would consider design mistakes, and it led me to revise my opinions on whether they're mistakes more than once. And I hopefully don't need to remind you that kids as a population have an incredibly long history of creating and evolving games. And this has been going on much longer than for the majority of adults who have ever lived, if you add up the, the time. Uh, so it was nice to hear that, that games um, like Journey, uh, Chris Bell was telling us uh, the games that emerged from the sandboxy system of Journey feel a lot like childhood games. They had chasing and hiding, racing and climbing and working together. Uh, and I found it really striking that uh, Chris described his philosophy as um, wanting to put as few handcuffs on the player as possible. Uh, because as an adult, and I've, I've spent most of my life playing and often designing multiplayer online <coughs> games for like the last 20 years. Uh, I, I felt weirdly incredibly constrained at the beginning of my experience with Journey. Like It was like I had my arms cut off and my tongue cut out, and I was thrown into a room with a stranger, and I didn't have any of these affordances that I'm used to in, uh, in online games where I can talk to people or I can do things like pick stuff up or, um, or do anything except for you know, maybe get away from someone or stay close to them. Um, but, but actually, that, that it led to a really, really positive experience once I accepted it. Uh, it was oddly freeing because of the constraints. It sort of reset me back to a kind of feeling that I had when I first started playing games online uh, two decades ago. Um, that, that sort of sense of wonder of encountering someone else the first time when I you know, exclaimed, oh, there's, a, there's a, a whole network of computers out there and there's people on it and they're playing games in Sweden because that's, that's where all the muds were back then. So, there's something about Journey that maybe has succeeded in sparking this mental quality of, uh, of Shoshin, the beginner's mind that uh, Richard LaMarchand mentioned. Um, kids tend to have this in abundance too. And so kids have this, uh, the beginner's mind, they accept that there are many possibilities out there. Uh, but for adults, uncertainty can be both uh, terrifying and liberating. Unfortunately, as we get older, the uncertainty of arbitrary systems that govern our lives that we don't fully understand, that we don't feel we have agency in, like really loses that fresh quality of Shoshin. And when we think about massive uncertainty, our mind goes to, to things that create huge anxiety, natural disasters, or what feels like, to many people, like the most uncertain and terrifying human design system of all, war, uh, at least as if it happened where you live rather than in some distant land. Um, and it was very poignant for me to hear uh, from David Ward that one of the highest purposes of war games is to reduce uncertainty in the theater of war, uh, at least at the scale where human lives are counted in hundreds or thousands rather than uh, whose individual single father or sister or child might die in a conflict, which is perhaps beyond anyone's control. Uh, and of course, how can we not feel some uncertain trepidation about the most terrifying potential future conflict of all, of course, I'm referring to the upcoming war between the laser dolphins and the spell suit ninjas. <laughs> so uncertainty is a big problem for all of us, and we try to, we try to manage it. Um, it's, it's hard in general, and there's a tension here for uh, us as people making entertainment products for gamers as well. 
as the game, gaming audience gets older, it sometimes feels like they're seeking out something more and more reliable to count on for familiar leisure experiences. Uh, but they still kind of want it to feel uncertain and new, too, right? They don't, they don't want to play the same game. They don't want the sequel of the game to, to have exactly the same features as last year's. Um, and and to work, at least if they are playing the same game, then it really has to be one that has a large range of uncertain outcomes. So there's this delicate balance here. Uh, sometimes like, I think of AAA developers dancing this dance all the time, trying to get the Metacritic score by balancing the right uh, amount of, of new surprise with familiar reassuring warmth um, as having a kind of 50s housewife problem. You know, your game audience gets home from a long day of work. They have expectations of something reliable and comforting to come back to a, a home and a, and a recliner and a dinner. Uh, but as a housewife, you're also supposed to be surprising an inventive sex kitten in the sack. You know, not too surprising. <laughs> Just like games. Just like games. So we have this whole niche of techniques that we use to try and manage this uncertainty and sort of shepherd people along. Um, this, I compiled this list, which feels to me like a certain a bible for a certain kind of game. Uh, we recapitulate these techniques over and over again to try and get a, a, a satisfying experience that stays at the right level of uncertainty. We've gotten so good at this, and um, the reason there's a chair on here is because this always makes me think of a talk where Will Wright described this particular quality of Shigeru Miyamoto's games um, as being a chair that's so comfortable that you don't want to get up from it. But if we're in this relationship with players where you know, maybe they come home at night, we entertain them, and we also surprise them, and they give us money, uh, that all sort of begs the question of what we really want our relationship with players to be like. So even if you're a AAA developer um, or a 50s housewife, you still have some agency in your relationship. You have, you have power in, what, in how things are emerging. I think it really behooves us to, to think really deeply about this relationship uh, between designers and players. Um, after all, there's an incredibly terrifying uncertainty about designing things and putting them out into the world, too. Uh, it might not be as immediately visceral as a stand-up comedian who steps up onto a stage and looks her audience in the eyes, but at least she can see that audience, kind of like I'm seeing you right now, and hear whether they're laughing or whether they're totally silent or heckling. I was actually at a, a stand-up performance that my, a friend of mine did the other day, and she was armed with like you know six or seven heckling responses, um, just r at the ready in case anything like that occurred. And that kind of immediacy and being able to, to have a direct connection with the audience is something that many people working on digital games experience much more rarely, some notable exceptions like, uh, like JS Joust. And I think this, uh, this creates different reactions for us as creators of digital games uh, to our psychology of how we try to orchestrate what happens in our relationship with the player, especially when we're thinking about millions of players who we may not ever even you know, know as individuals or even en masse and, uh, and probably won't get to, to see or directly influence their play experiences at all. So when we tackle this, um, you know, there are a bunch of familiar approaches, some of which we've already discussed here. You, know, you can think of the player as uh, someone who you can stick a funnel into their head and then pour different things into the funnel that you think will, will create a meaningful experience. This is, of course, a really classic view. It's a, you know, a little bit like the, uh, the what's called the banking model of education. And uh, Dan Cook mentioned uh, this in his discussion of content. Um, another variation on this I think of as the, the revelatory truth, where as a designer you, you are constructing something by chipping away at a rock. Uh, that by making a system that speaks to some something essential that's out there in the world that you are you're showing to to the player and uh, you're you're revealing that actually what you've created is is a magnificent statue that was just waiting there inside of the rock and then the player is completely amazed and moved by your truth and and, and swayed to your way of thinking uh, or you know when we think about games with messages there's often this idea of oh let's figure out how to how to influence and move the player but we have to do it subtly because if we just told them what we wanted them to do, like oh we want you to learn a particular thing, or we want you to think that um, you know that a polit particular political stance is positive or negative, or that maybe you should go out and volunteer for a community garden, 
Um, we have to sort of be sneaky about it, because if we just gave someone a pamphlet that said that, we sort of know that it wouldn't work. People have done that before. So it has to sort of feel like it's the player's idea. So again, we're sort of like maybe pushing the player to do something. And what I wonder if this all resolves to is just this feeling of like, we want the player to, to look at the game that we've created and, and just be completely enthralled by it and love it. Because as Dan said, you know, we, we really want to get positive feedback and feel good about ourselves. But one thing that all these techniques have in common is that we're, we're all, there are all ways for us to try and manage what's going on in this relationship by, by trying to act on the player. And this is a great relief, of course. So when I think about the, the connection between designer and player and how fraught it is, how difficult the communication often is, how indirect it has to be, I often wonder, you know, is there a way of creating a more meaningful connection? Something that, that might resemble the way that, that since the 70s, certain people thinking about education have, have said, well, maybe we ought to reconsider the teacher-student relationship. Maybe we ought to think of teachers as being teacher slash students and students as students slash teachers. And of course, we've already tossed around this weekend the uh, concept of the player designer. But the, the idea that maybe players have something just as valuable to give back to us, um, I, I still, still think it's something we're just barely scratching the surface of. So back to uncertainty. Um, I think that because this is a part and parcel of what games deal in, it behooves us to think not only for games, but for our lives in general, to, like, to think about how out of control the whole world is by its nature. Uh, and how out of control games are if we really sort of let them take full expressions as systems that have deeply emergent possibilities. And so I think this has come up many times in this conference, and I sort of called a selection of quotes. Um, games can evolve beyond your own capabilities to play them, um, as I'm sure many of us have found. Uh, games are, are hard to nail down. This is something that, that Annika said about rules um, being both incomplete and imprecise. And that we, you know, we, we can't even exactly say what the outcome is, nor would we want to, since it actually might destroy the, the valuable uncertainty that, uh, that inheres in every instance of playing a game. Uh, then we started you know, talking about other players as well. Uh, Chris described the, the presence of another player as a bit of flux that appears in the game. <coughs> And this is, this is where things start to suddenly feel dangerous with the, the re-emergence of multiplayer games. Um, like Dan was saying, that are, are becoming more and more a, a part of the terrain in the game industry. Um, David mentioned that, uh, that it's vital to figure out what players can do in the system uh, rather than the designer, so that it's, it's not such, uh, so much central messaging and control, but that it's distributed. And then, of course, um, Dan talked a lot about this, about his shift in thinking between thinking of players as consumers, uh, not, not just as consumers, but as little energy cells to, to uh, interact with each other. And for me, this was one of the most striking exchanges of the whole conference that actually happened on Twitter. So I'm not sure if all of you have seen it. But Frank noted that, um, that Dan had, uh, had said that, the, that the, uh, the economy of Realm of the Mad God was massively transformed uh, and a trade culture emerged by the introduction of dropping. And then Raph Koster, who, if you don't know, is a designer of Ultima Online and uh, Star Wars Galaxies and many other very seminal multiplayer online games, um, noted that, the, uh, that modern MMOs, like World of Warcraft, have kind of tried to eliminate this particular feature, the idea of dropping. And this is, this, um, I realized this when I was like, oh, that's so true. And it's something I'd been thinking about for a while because when I was learning about MMOs, which happened throughout the late 90s and on into the 2000s, uh, there was this idea that what really creates severe problems that can just spin out of your control, that can really uh, make a whole economy pear-shaped, is if s somehow players manage to ex start to exchange things with each other, right? And that's exactly the kind of nuclear furnace that, uh, that Dan has discovered in his own work, uh, that can just explode the, the possibilities, not only for, for economies changing in uh, radically uncertain ways, but also create cultures uh, in part maybe to deal with and, and manage that uncertainty. So I, I found this really striking, and it said to me, maybe we all ought to be thinking more about 
how much we, we need to be in control over what's happening in our game, and how, how much can we cede, not just to, to players to sort of get involved in design, but also just to the workings of the system. Um, so what the hell are we doing? Maybe it's, it's not even really necessary to come up with answers, as uh, Tracy suggested. I really like this quote um, that came out of her work with Bill Viola, that maybe we, you know, we don't need to, to know exactly how things are going to play out, and we can't. We don't even need to know all of the, the leaves on the possibility tree that might come up in our game. Um, and that there's an inherent messiness to games, the messiness implied by practice, which I have capitalized so that now this quote also refers to this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Since I think the, the part of the value of this conference is in its messiness too. And then uh, uh, an especially striking tweet by Charles Pratt, who said um, maybe the, the thing that we shouldn't be arguing about, uh, we shouldn't be arguing about defining games, because can games be designed at all? <laughs> can they be, and, and is Charles here? No, so it's, it's not clear whether this was a typo or not. <laughs> but I, so he, he may have meant to say that whether games can be defined at all, but that's just not even as interesting a tweet. So I think he, he, he refused on Twitter to say whether it was a typo. <laughs> but this is, works out great for me because I'm like, yeah, can we even design games at all? <laughs> or, or do they design us? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I don't have a quote for our resident chaos physicist and, uh, and EVE Online designer, but he doesn't even really need one because his game kind of speaks for itself. Um, it is sort of one of the most ambitious and risk-taking MMOs to ever come out on the market, um, where the emergent possibilities and the ways that things can just go totally sideways, out of control, and just ruin players' experience is just completely accepted by CCP as being part of what makes, the, makes EVE Online distinctive and important. Um, and so I'm, I'm always impressed by them, and I'm completely terrified to play EVE. <laughs> um, so th that's worth thinking of too, but maybe it's because I haven't come to terms with, with uncertainty myself. Um, but, but I thought it was it's, it's great that, um, that he has a, a degree in chaos physics. It's, it's perfect for this type of game, or, or maybe it's something that we should all be studying more of, because the idea that we can create these robust sandboxes that players can mess around with at a local level and just screw everything up, but it does not have to mean that the entire system just falls over. That if, if we create robust systems, that there are possibilities for, for uncertainty, for emergence, for beautiful things to happen, for weird things to happen, um, that players can make sense of. Uh, just like Stone was saying, when, when the system is a little jinky in SimCity, players can fill in that gap and narrativize what's going on uh, when a, a particular sim cannot manage to get a burger. So I, the good news is that I think that we have a lot of ways of thinking about uncertainty, just as Jesse was saying yesterday, uh, because of our practice of playing and designing games. And there are a lot of things out there that sort of explore this terrain of, of making the, the possibility space of games uh, more wild, or maybe as wild as it always has been, and that maybe we've looked away from sometimes. Uh, of course, there's the, the game of sandbox for players to encounter each other in uh, something that uh, that both that Chris talked about as well as I'm sorry, what's the name? Kiartan. Sorry, and um, game as platform to, for players to create new games on top of um, in Journey or obviously in games like Minecraft. Uh, games as an object that doesn't have a single fixed meaning. This maybe is the minimum case. It's something that's been talked about in literature and film for years, but it seems like we're still struggling with it in some corners of the game industry where, um, where creators of games are insisting that, that they get to determine the meaning of a game. Um, a game is a creation that comes alive through performance. This is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, where per, you know, perhaps the players of games are, are closer than we might think to being like designers, just as uh, when we think about in music, the relationship between a composer and a musician is being collapsed constantly over and over throughout the history of music. And it doesn't seem to have you know, made that, that uh, cultural form disappear. Uh, a game is a conversation where you just have no idea what will emerge, which is uh, an attribute of a lot of excellent dinner conversation, right? 
And um, a game as an inspiration for spin-off creations by other players, uh, like the, the cosplay that we saw earlier from League of Legends. That's, that's also one that's been working really well ever since the internet came around. And then lastly, I'm wondering, you know, maybe some games are really just an invitation into the people who created the game, into their own broken thought processes. Maybe we don't need to sort of clean up our own mess before we design something. You know, may maybe it's okay to have games that are really broken or unbalanced, as there were some suggestions at the beginning of this conference, <coughs> because um, we can invite players to, to make of it what they will, or even to, to suggest solutions to those problems, to, to see new lenses on the things that are challenging us uh, through the act of playing and interpreting. And so I would just like to, to close with this image from the end of Snowfield, um, Matthew's game that we talked about earlier, because I think it's beautiful. Thank you. together, at least for this year, uh, as a group, um, wanting to get feedback from you. So Dylan, uh, I want to make sure that someone is taking notes from the conversation. So what, what do we want to ask, Frank? Um, I just ask people for, for feedback and, and comments, final thoughts, uh, suggestions for next year, yeah. anything along those lines. And, and he, we're, we're, we'll, we'll leave it right, wide open right now. Yes, Ilya. Uh, I, I have a great time with the conference. I have two suggestions for next year, things to consider. Maybe a uh, workshop, uh, more people from other countries, uh, especially of South America and Asia. You mean uh, speakers? Speakers, yeah. Uh, and uh, more designers who work by themselves are like, self-conscious out of more, more, More solo <laughs> self uh, uh, <laughs> designers, OK? Um, what, 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 what do you mean by workshop? What would you like to see? Specifically, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean like a half day alone in a room with a single person? Short form exercise, maybe an hour, hour and a half, uh, with uh, one or two speakers, and together. Okay, so you want something that feels more hands-on? Yeah. All right, great suggestions. More, yeah. I love the open game design problem session, but the but two minutes isn't enough time to really give people the the issue, uh, you know, that you're trying to solve. And so I wonder if fewer people, fewer people, and you know, like and a little bit longer, a little longer time. Yeah, Raise your hand if you if you agree with Josh that you think there should have been less people and more time per issue. I mean, less raise your hand if you feel like it was okay as it was, and we shouldn't. I, I don't mean. Fewer I think it's like, about half and half. I mean, we can split the room in, in two groups, right? And, and, and each presenter gets twice. Yeah, no, we, okay, we could do that. One of the decisions we made, is the design decisions about practice, is we did want it to be a single track uh, conference so that everybody sees the same stuff and there aren't, there isn't some great insight that someone else references that you didn't hear because you were in the other track at the same time. Maybe open problems would be the exception to that. But, um, but that's a good suggestion. What about interstitial time? Don't ask about it. Interstitial time. Okay, interstitial time meaning lunch, uh, the social time, the parties, the half hours between sessions. Raise your hand if you would like more interstitial time than we have. Even like a one less panel or one less. Like less stuff, and, and more. Bigger raise room. your hand if you thought it was about right or even too much. Okay, all right, so, so it seems like about right, but, but you had a comment on that. Um, I was just going to reply back. At dinner, at least, a lot of people came to me and talked about the design problem with the postcards, and I felt like having that extra time, like just two minutes for me to get up and talk about it, but that generated conversation that didn't happen in that room, which I thought was great. So I felt like you know, there's a lot of ideas in that really small amount of space. Yeah. You could take it outside of that. Right. Also, I saw Josh DeBonis leading a 12-person design seminar on Killer Queen this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, getting lots of good feedback, but I think that's a good point. Uh, let's, let's hear more about the interstitial time, social activities, while we're on the topic. Uh, yeah, Josh. Well, I definitely love that. And I definitely like the uh, like coffee break time after every session. So I love seeing talk about it. Um, one thing about the open sessions though, is that you could potentially have people submit uh, questions to forward and then send that out to everyone so that everyone sort of has a little more time and there's not. Oh, actually, people have people write up what they're going right. to say and have people. 
Would, would you guys really have done that? Like <laughs> gone through a list of, of 10 or 15 questions and think about this a lot to, I, I, my, my sense is that it's the improvisational think on your feet nature that makes it, but there may be something about doing less of them. Should that session have been shorter? You, you feel like you just didn't have time. Okay. Uh, wh whether or not it's whether or not the audience reads all the questions is a se is separate from whether or not the uh, the askers have prepared their questions because it, it may even be a good exercise for people to send their questions in ahead of time even if no one and if no one reads them. <laughs> L let me ask you guys a question that's on my mind while I don't see any hands up. Um, uh, last year we had more things that were really staged debates. I don't know if you remember Chris Hecker and Nick Fortuna, for example, <laughs> going head to head for for a full session. Raise your hand if you would like more things that were like the, our, the Not Games panel that you would you wanted more things that were debates, which would be less content delivered but more conversation discussion debate. Raise your hand if you want more debate type stuff. Oh, I would say le far less than half. Raise your hand if you thought the balance was right or if you thought we had plenty of debate. All right, interesting. So they don't they don't want debates. Um, uh, what other, so yes, Naomi. Um, I'm not sure if this year was really a debate. Like last year, last year was clearly presented as like there's two sides point counter right. on the issue, and I don't think that the games not games was structured like that. And which did you prefer? I, I like the panel this year. I, I think that there is something exciting and likely about having two people taking up positions. Right. Second. Second, okay. If, let me ask a question, because actually this is the hardest thing about those, these, these damn debate-like panels, is actually choosing the issue. What is a vital issue where you feel like, it's not just like, oh, like for example, we were going to do games and art. That could be a debate, and we thought, oh, the, we, we rolled our eyes together and knocked, knocked some <laughs> ceiling tiles off. Because that's like, that's the, that's the thing that everyone is sick of hearing debated. But what is something that would make a good meaty debate? Kevin. Uh, yeah, I should say last year, I think game design business would be a really interesting one. Game yeah. design versus business, or, yeah, yeah okay, good one. Okay. Scott. Um, uh, I think Naomi called it out, but that relation, whether you need to make the player understand what they're doing or learning in the game, and whether that's a duty of the, the gamer, or of the, of the player, or the... Player the in the dark versus player not in the dark, right. yeah. So following up with Kevin, specifically the ethics of monetization. Yeah. The ethics, the game where game design and ethics interfere. Is, yeah. is grinding ethical, for example, right. our virtual yeah. goods ethical? Addic yeah, addiction. Ad addiction is yeah. another one. Sarah? I would love to see a discussion of representation. Uh, representation specifically, um, like of characters, you character for example, I think or that could mean a lot of different things. But I guess like identity and representation. As identity a, as a debate or just someone talking about it. Um, I think that could be a panel. It could be one person who specializes in that. But I also wanted to. Um, I had a, a question or suggestion or whatever. Let, hold on to that. Let's just finish. Let's finish getting this. What are some good debate topics? Yes, Clara. I'll get to all. We'll get to everybody. Why aren't there as many women in the uh, game development? Why aren't there, okay, many women in game development, Rob? A apropos of Dan Cook's talk, like uh, taking up the position of one source of value in games as uh, the most important versus another. The different sources of value. So some, some of the ethics and money maybe could fall into that larger category too. Yeah. Is price gouging okay? Is price <laughs> gouging okay? Are there any other topics for debates, debate possible topics or panel, panel slash debate topics? Well, are there any other panels you guys would like to see? Maybe some of these might be like representation more of a panel discussion. Yes? Did you feel like you got some of that implicitly or explicitly in the talks? Not, not much. Okay. Playtesting, which I find it playtesting specifically, but player in general. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to, like to learn more about designing for disabled players, designing games for other able players. Mm -hmm. All right, so designing for different audiences, mm -hmm. including differently able players. Accessibility. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'd like to see something about linear design versus non linear design. 
giving a guaranteed experience versus having like an open world where the player can explore. Okay, nice topic. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe. <laughs> Maybe um, um, a few talks um, that are more exclusively about specific projects. About specific projects. Whether it's, whether it's the creative of that project or someone else, rather than mentioning the project within the context of the So you'd like more concrete, nitty gritty, get down to details, forget about all the theoretical, like high fluid ideas on balance. You'd like to see more of that, more concrete stuff. Or, or maybe like more of a, a critique session of a specific game or something. A critique session of a specific game. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, Grant? Stuff on uh, visual communication, either to developers or like players themselves. And then like just looking into the like spreadsheet <coughs> was like super good, right? Like right. knowing more about that kind of stuff felt really nice. So but again, more of a nitty gritty, and specifically visual communication. Yeah, go. Yeah, this is like a critique idea. Something I've always wanted to see at a conference is like get people who know each other well enough, but then have them tell each other why they hate each other's games. Like, but like not in like, a <laughs> stupid way. Right. Like, well, I love you, but like, man, I really couldn't get into your game. Like, because like, we like, there's so much like back padding, and you know, the music that we're in, that's great. Right. But, like, boy, would it be cool to like really see, and they would be kind of like discussing. You have, you have to handpick like, the right people. And, yeah, like, I think there's there's definitely like, something to the this critique idea. Yeah, Nick. Is this is this good to try to make a player stick to your game, or should we set a limit that <coughs> if we get enough, can make we think? So addiction and, and maybe again the ethics of design relative to, to addiction. Uh, I really like the Rogers Redding talk last year and this year David's talk basically just coming from sort of game design circles outside of those that we typically sort of communicate with. Should we have so, more, more? Yeah, I'm suggesting a second keep one. Keep it going. At least a second one. Another yeah. like, hop out. So we have very few slots if you really go through the map. I'm so saying bump it up to two. Raise your hand if you would like to see another non tabletop video game designer in balance. Okay. Yeah. What about like about a, a, about a third? What about right? a game show designer? Is that something? Yeah. 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 Get like Steve. Like a Mark Burnett type. Get yeah. Steve Ritchie. Anybody who knows knows Mark Burnett? Okay. Yeah. These are great. <laughs> Let me ask another question. What can we do? Let's forget about the conference <coughs> sessions we've talked about now a bit. What about the other conference? Everything from the refreshments to the parties. Should that, well, should actually let me ask one question first about the overall. Should this question, should this conference be a little bit longer? Do we need more time? Should it be two and a half days, for example, instead of two days? Raise your hand if you feel like it should be longer, even a little bit longer. Okay, raise your hand if you feel like it's about the right or maybe too much. Okay, that's about half and half. Um, so you, you just want more good stuff, or do you just feel like? What about okay, what about the non-conference time? What can we do to make that better? The party, the reception, the refreshments, Sarah? I saw a really great um, you know, student representation here, and it would be great as... Um, saw a really great what? I saw a really great student representation, and I think it would be really interesting to take this as an opportunity since Game Center is presenting a pretty cohesive, like, sort of, you know, sort of thesis with the conference, or there are a lot of ideas being presented that might be reflected in the student work to see student work either in the hallway or at the party or uh -huh. have student work and sharing that and talking about that be part of it more. So you'd like to have student work on uh, avail available for play. And maybe okay. with the response you know, from the people who are here who are experts. Seconded. OK, why, why student work? Why wouldn't anyone be able to just yeah. win their game? Why students? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, the whole discussion about, you know, you guys had the Ivory Tower talk last year, and I think now that there's an MFA program, having the MFA students be, yeah. you know, involved in discussing their experience. Raise, their game. raise your hand if you're a designer and you would like to have an opportunity for not the, the two minute open problems, but a demo, like standing by your game while people walk by and you play it. Raise your hand if you'd like that. Wait, yeah, oh, wait. that's a lot of people. Are you so that, that would be a, that would you mean, a whole big event. Do you, in do you mean presenting it like upstage or like having it be like just out here, right? Maybe because I think those are drastically think, different. Post yeah. session. Well, right? what do you well, what do you think? No, I feel like it, it, it can't just be like an open problem. Here's my demo. That's pretty cool. No, right? it, 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 it had to be something that's conversational. Like an evening event, like yeah. during the reception, for example, or uh, a yeah. Can you ask about the dates? The dates. Okay, so it's very hard to find a date that works for all schedules. We're kind of sandwiched, I think, between like IndieCade, MIGS, and Project Horseshoe. 
Feedback on the dates, earlier, later, different time of the year, what do people think? David it. likes the dates. It's good? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's good? Not during a hurricane. <laughs> Damn, we <laughs> tried. <laughs> I know, so close. Um, yes? Not immediately before the game, but on the midterm. I'm talking to Frank Lance about that. Can anyone on the, anyone who helped plan the conference, uh, Charles, Dylan, Kevin, is there anything else we wanted feedback on? Yes. You brought it up the very first day, that projector was just horrible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're, I agree. Right. This, 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 this room is pretty good, though. Do people yeah. like the room? Yeah. 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 Josh. This is the problem last year, too, that there's no lighting for the speaker. So you can use, you know, when they turn, turn the lights down, everybody's just yeah, but you know what, I just, I mean, I've been using this little panel that's on and off, and I just saw this one for the first time 10 minutes ago, and it does have four buttons, so maybe there was a way to do that, but I'm an idiot. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, Chris. I think a lot of the Twitter discussions, I think, that are happening in the background are really nice, but for a lot of people, they forget that stuff's going on. It'd be nice if there was a little piece of where you just project that and just have that. We have the Tumblr. I, I, I agree. There's probably a, a way to get more of a presence of that uh, ongoing. I think that's a good idea. Ilya. Uh, I just want to say that it would be really great that none of the presentations overlapped, and whatever else we do, you should definitely keep that. Good. What do you mean none of them overlapped? Oh, single, 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 single track. track. Every single thing, and that was kind of great. Uh, okay. Um, what do, do yes? Um, this is like a completely a side note. probably silly, but thank you for not having it. Who raise your hand if you would like a social event that's more like playing board games or anything? Is that just people? <laughs> Do you guys want more time to interact socially that's planned through the conference? Yes. When, 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 and how would that would we do that? We have a reception the first night. Yeah. All right. Go we'll ask yourself a problem. Yes. Any suggestions? Uh, yeah. For that, I mean, you could have an option for like you could go to the party, or there's this board games thing, and you know that. Could be yeah, but then it's like, oh, it's really open to talk to Richard Garfield. I guess I went to the wrong room of the. You can always ask him. Which but yeah, that's, that, 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 that's a single track idea. But yeah, that's that's what that is one solution. Yeah, Chris. What about during the lunch session? You have board games in different rooms and people can Yeah, talk well, last year we had one hour, this year we had 90 minutes. My, my feeling is that they need to be two hour lunches if we're gonna be able to play board games, you know, for an hour grabbing lunch and session playing over. But I mean, providing lunches, like, yeah. that would be something better. Providing lunches, who, raise your hand if you'd like us to provide lunch. Okay, that's our second most people. And okay, final suggestions, yeah. Who food? Um, about the lunch and uh, dinner stuff, would there be a way to create a more structured social time if, uh, if there were an option to go and have lunch or dinner with people who wanted to talk about it? Like like uh, topic oriented topic social oh. engineering. Yeah. Here's a lunch table with this sign on it and this sign on it and right. something like that. Would you guys like that? Yeah. Yes. If it was yes. seamless. Okay, so we can we can work on that. <laughs> who? Final comment, yes. Not uh, I, I think it's sort of interesting, like Naomi's talk at the end was really interesting, and I'm sure there's lots of nice like press coverage and conversations that will occur after this, but it, it would uh, be nice to kind of have a reminder somewhere online of like, you know, these were your takeaways six months ago from practice. Please don't tell me you've already forgotten to be. I, I, th I think that's the beautiful thing about the Tumblr that, that um, What's the URL again? Dylan put together. It is nyupractice2012.tumblr. <laughs> um, so I, and I think that that's actually going to be there's going to be our best advertisement for practice next year. Um, all right, uh, thank you thank guys you. for excellent. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.